in class, as well as other times, we've talked about how God has uh, used physical things in the Old Testament to kind of teach us uh, spiritual messages. <coughs> and one of the illustrations has to do with building a house. And so I thought, well, who's better to speak on this than me? <laughs> and so some of this lesson, you'll see me involved in it. But all we're trying to do is make the application to building the spiritual house, and that requires a number of things. It requires the plans, it requires the tools, it requires the materials, it requires cost, and then obviously the time that's going. But all of this is we're going to be making our relationships, we're going to show that we're expected to build a spiritual house. I could have put in the lesson, but I didn't. But uh, we were talking about David and how David was looking at his house and said, well, there's no house for the Lord. And he wanted to build a house for the Lord in the Old Testament. And we do know that during Solomon's time, we had the temple that was built. But still, that was a physical thing to represent something uh, that was spiritual. Uh, so I said I wasn't going to put it in the lesson, but I guess it just did. Didn't it? <laughs> uh, but I, that's not the primary focus of it. The biblical use of the term of, of a house, we see it a number of different times. In Matthew chapter 7, a familiar text to most of us, in verse 24 starting, it says, Therefore, who hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Now, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So Jesus uses this example of, of building, and he's talking here of foundation, and we'll make mention of it again just a little bit later. In the third chapter of the book of Hebrews, the writer says, for this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, and this is talking about Jesus, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. So there's sort of that spiritual connection also that the Hebrew writer is saying that this is a house that's built by God or by Jesus Christ, and they really own the house as well. In Galatians chapter 2, verse number 18, Paul says, For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. So he's using that phrase of doing some kind of a building. And it, just as we're building character and developing character, there's that analogy that we're building upon something that already existed to start with. He says in Romans chapter 15, verse 20, And so I've made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. So he understood the same as Peter when Peter acknowledged that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus was talking about there the foundation, himself being that foundation. And that's the reference that Paul's making to it as well. But what is your spiritual house and how do we go about building that? Well, our spiritual house really has to do with our relationship to God how we are related to him. It's going to start with our faith and we're going to be building upon that faith and not just building it, but we're going to maintain it. We're never going to lose faith. And that also is reference to our spiritual condition. How does God see us? Are we a man that he would call righteous as we have him say about several Bible characters that we can read of in the scripture? But we know that there's different kinds of houses when we're looking at the physical things. You can see a house that is well built and you'll see that there's a real solid construction that was used. Then you can see some poorly built houses. Patty and I have kind of gone around looking at some model homes and so forth and even ones that have the same price tag as ones in another community. Some of them are not as well built as, as the other. Uh, but you can find those, and not necessarily shoddy in those particular stances, but in many places there are real shoddy craftsmanship and construction. And then there's those houses that they started out good, but then you didn't maintain them, and then you've allowed them to decay, and you've allowed them to deteriorate over a period of time. 
But what we're talking about, since there's this reference about building, especially the Hebrew writer, uh, what kind of house are we building? And in Acts chapter 7, verse 49, what house will you build for me, says the Lord. And so that's sort of our reference point, that we're building something right now. Well, hopefully we haven't built it, we're letting it deteriorate. Hopefully we're building it and we're improving it and we're maintaining it. So for building our spiritual house, the analogy to the physical, always through this illustration, we first must have some kind of a plan. And so we might have a blueprint and we try to follow that plan. Uh, people ask me a lot of times, where's my blueprint? And I say, well, it's up here in my head. And well, it's sometimes better to put it down in writing. And if I go to the permit office, I've got to have it in writing and I've got to show them exactly what I'm doing. But there has to be some kind of planning. So can you imagine starting a house with no idea of the size or the style or how it's arranged? And believe it or not, there are people that build just exactly like that. I've known at least one person in the past, whatever he found discarded, he, he used that. Matter of fact, I saw one on TV. It was kind of a little mansion almost, but everything in it was found out of the scrap heap someplace. And uh, so he didn't know what size it was going to be. It just depended on what the scraps were. And as kids, I think we all probably, as guys, you know, that was the guy thing, uh, that we'd build that little clubhouse. And it was just scraps that we found to, to do it with. But we're going to build something tangible. And so there has to be something beyond that. And so as we would think, it, it would be in not something we would imagine for our families and be the place we'd really want to, to live if we had no idea the size, the style, or how it's arranged. But there are a lot of folks that try to build their spiritual house just that way. They just don't have any plan, don't have any thinking process to it. And it is what it is, this is kind of how they would look at it. And so they really don't even have an idea of what the finished product's going to look like. At least if I'm building a physical house and I have some sort of planning uh, stages involved, I can maybe picture that house before I've ever moved into it. I can picture the end result. Well, the spiritual house, we need to picture that end result also. What do I want to be like? What does this house want to be like? And how will God look upon that house once it's built? And so folks that just are going through with no plan, they have no idea what they have, and nor do they even know what they need. You know, there's just no thought process to it, to it at all. And sometimes Christians would be like that, where they would just assemble and that's all they do. And there's little more that they would say, well, I'm spiritual because I go to church once a week or something like that. You know, and that's a little bit more to it than that as we'll look at in, in our lesson. So we do want to start out with some kind of a plan. Now for this to be something uh, that we really are going to live in and we can appreciate, we've got to be realistic. Now, maybe we'll do our pipe dreams and then we'll hone that thing down. So what is it that you really want? And then uh, now let's be realistic. You know, some of these TV programs, they'll show somebody a house much beyond what they can afford. And uh, so now you can't afford that. That's like $2 million. But on your $400,000 budget, you got to be realistic. You got to look at it. And for this house, there has to be some flexibility too. You know, you can't just be, because things might not work out exactly like you think they ought to. And so you have to be flexible with this and willing to change where there can be improvements. Always trying to look to do it a little bit better. Uh, somehow, some way you don't recognize that until you're in the middle of the process so many times. So when I'm looking at what I want to be, and as a Christian for the spiritual house, what is it that I really think I need to be like? Well, I would suggest that what Peter is saying in first, Second Peter chapter 1, he gives a long list of things, and you can look that passage up for those other things this morning. Uh, but he says, add to your faith virtue, and then he goes on with that list. Remember, we started that out in one of our slides earlier. We've got to have faith to start with. That's the beginning point. So I want to be a person of faith. And I've got to add to that faith. It's not just that I have faith in God and faith in Jesus and, and he'll take care of me. But what characteristics do I need to take on? 
that is a part of me believing in God. And I can't do this without having some kind of knowledge. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying in chapter 5 and 11 and 12, that you're, you're just babes. You need to have gone beyond this. You need to go beyond some of these first principles, and you need to, to build upon that. And then as I'm making these applications in my life, uh, Paul is saying to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, 12, and also the same idea in Titus 2, verse 20, you got to be an example to others. And with Timothy, Paul would say, people can see your progress and see how you've grown. And some of you can see progress in, in uh, your family members and people you've been associated with since they became Christians. You see that they're more spiritually minded now than they were before. You see that progress. Well, God obviously will see whether you're progressing or whether you're staying the same. Remember what he says in the book of Revelation? He didn't like lukewarm. You know, he wants you to make a decision and he'd prefer you to be high because Jesus died for all, the whole world and that would be people that really understand what this is all about. And so we want to be more acceptable to God, presenting ourselves as an acceptable person. You could add in Romans chapter 12, the first couple of verses, and that equals that. It talks about the, the living sacrifice that's acceptable to God. And so this is sort of my goal of what I would like to see about myself. This is who I want to be. And so I've got to begin with sort of a, a vision of what the ideal Christian would be like. And I chose Colossians chapter 1, a few verses, starting at verse number 9 to help illustrate that point. He says, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So this should be our prayer for any new Christian that any new Christian, and as well as someone that's been a Christian for some period of time, that we have this knowledge, and we, and with that knowledge, we will have this wisdom and spiritual understanding. And then he goes on to say at verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So that's walking worthy. That would be that good, faithful servant that he would be able to say to us. And then verse 11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who hath qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. So there's that strength that comes. I'm going to walk worthy and then I've been strengthened and I'm building upon that faith and I shall not be moved. And there's a song that I don't know if it's in this song book or not, but I shall not be moved, you know, and it's out of the, out of the Psalms, and uh, the psalmist talks about, about that concept as well. So we've got the plan. Now I need to know how to build. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, just try, imagine trying to build, and some people say, I can't build anything. I can't put a nail in two boards, and, and the two boards stay together. Uh, if you have no clue how to frame and hang a door or to wire or do the plumbing and the list goes on with all of that, that's all a part of this process, you know, of building this house. And so I might not have any clue. And then I don't know the order. Which one should I do first? And some of us that maybe have thought we knew and we did it and then we had to undo because something else should have happened first. Never been there before? Yeah. Several of us have been there before, and that's a question people ask us all the time about our house. Do you do this before you do that or do that? And in some cases, it don't really matter, but in some cases, it absolutely does matter. You know, Some attempt to build their faith with no idea. They just, well, they became Christians, and they just believe that through osmosis or something, they'll get stronger because they have no clue uh, on, on how to build. They, they just are out there not even sure that they even know that they need to build. So we need to understand how faith is built. That's a part of this process. And then we need to know how to make this house strong so that it'll withstand. A house built here might be different than a house that was built in Miami because of the hurricanes that would come in. Different building over in California where the earthquakes, different building where you have the grounds that sink for whatever reason. 
reasons, but men don't necessarily know about it when they start to build, but that's something you need to explore to start with. But you need to make the house strong, our spiritual house, we want to be strong so that we won't be moved, as I mentioned a moment ago. And then we need to know, well, what needs to come first, second, and third? How do I go about doing this? I need to know sort of the order. Well, I've got to build with the Word of God. That's where it starts. That's how I knew that I needed to become a Christian. That's how I knew about God. That's how I knew about Christ was from the Word of God to start with. And so we've got God's Word, and we see the early Christians, and we see the apostles as they're going out presenting God's Word. And we see, like at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where brethren there were sharing together God's Word. And they had miraculous spiritual gifts even in that day, but that they were to do things orderly, decently, and in order in the doing of all of this. But it's God's word that's going to be taught and be understood, not by just pure enthusiasm and excitement. We can get that, you know, through entertainment processes, uh, and and it's kind of sometimes it's it's good to have enthusiasm. But it's not directed enthusiasm. It's or misdirected in so many cases. But that enthusiasm, you can have that and still have not know what you're doing at all. You're just so excitable. And I, you probably know people like that. None are here or there, but uh, you know people that are that are very excited about everything, and they have no clue what's even going on. Uh, and it's not just by mere associations or just because something is, is fun. Is through regular systematic study. And that's what the brethren did in the early church. You know, the Bereans were searching to see if these things were so. And we need to evaluate the message that we're hearing and make sure that it is from God's word, that it's not contradicting. God's word doesn't contradict and it won't be confusing. We want to find the clarity that, that's there. And it's not just by random study. Well, I'll just someday pick this up and study just a little bit here and there. But we do need to uh, put some kind of a system to it and do something on a more regular basis. And so it's not hit and miss classes and sermons. And it's just there needs to be some regularity to it. We've got to build. It's like our diet for our bodies. We we've got to build some kind of regularity with that and and do the right things in order for our bodies to sustain themselves as they should. And then we need to grasp the basics before we go deeper. And I've illustrated this before. A lot of times when we ask people, what do you want to study in class? A lot of new Christians say, book of Revelation. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, and okay, which view are we going to take today? You know, on that. And there's so many different views that's there. And this new Christian doesn't even know the basics as of yet. You know, and so that's not exactly the point. And again, back to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, the writer there is saying, you do need to have these basics, but you need to move beyond that. But you're not capable of that beyond. And so he said, we will take the time to give you the basics. So what's he saying? You've got to have the basics. You can't build until you've started that basic. Uh, you get to that point to start with. And then you've got to know before you teach and help others. And that's kind of confusing because how much do you have to know before you can teach someone? And James is talking about not being many, many teachers. And he's talking about the great responsibility that's there. Because if I teach you wrong and you accept that, then you're wrong. But guess what? I'm still wrong too. And I've influenced you towards this. So you need to study and find out and you need to correct the teacher if he's wrong. But before you can teach, but there are some things you can teach. If you know how you became a Christian, for sure you can tell other people how you became a Christian. That you can teach. Now, you might not know about realized eschatology, because those are two words you can't even, well, you might could spell realized, but eschatology, you have to think about just a little bit. You might not even know what that is. You know, well, that's okay. You don't have to know that in order to go to heaven. But people that believe in that, there's a theory, that a uh, system that you'll follow, and you might not make it to heaven if you do what they're, they're teaching. But you don't need to know all that. You don't need to find out every subject before you can become a Christian. Become a Christian, and then let's start the growing process. 
So there's some things you might not be ready for. And I believe that's what, what the writer of Hebrews 5 is really saying to us, is that you need to have this and we've got to give it. So no matter how many times I've told you the basics, or whoever the teacher is, we'll tell you one more time until you've got them. And then we can go from that. And so we need to have all of these basics in order to be able to prevent and handle problems because our problem solution is going to come with how well we've handled God's word. It's the wisdom for that knowledge that we've, we've acquired. Hebrews 2 verse 1 says, therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. And so here's what I know, and this is what I built on, but if I haven't become solid on this, a false teacher can come along and carry me easily away to, to his way of thinking. But I need to be solid and know that this is what God's word says. The third point in building the house is having the right foundation. And we started that with our lesson a bit ago. We have the good foundation, and we know how extremely important that is because everything's going to be built on that foundation. The whole house rests upon that foundation. If the foundation itself is weak, then the house is in danger. And people even around here have had foundation problems, even though we don't usually have that bad kind of soil. And the whole house could be condemned if the foundation is not fixed somehow, some way. But if the foundation is strong, then you can build a solid house on that and everything has become strong as a result of it. And so back to our Hebrews text, chapters five and six. The foundation of the first principles must be laid down. Let's go back to the basics and let's learn what these, these things are. And I've given a list of several things that I've kind of considered first principles and you could add to this list. But we need to understand inspiration to start with, to know that the scripture has come from God. It's reliable, it's from God. It was given to certain people through inspiration and they passed this mess message on. And in that, we appreciate who Jesus is, and we understand that he's deity, that in the beginning, we go back to Genesis 1 and, and just see the creation. Let us make man in our image, and we see Christ being a part of that, that process. The God before he even made man, he knew that we would need a Savior when he did make man, and he made a plan for it. And so when Jesus does appear on the scene in the human form, we need to understand that that, is, that was the Messiah that was here, and he's still the Messiah now, reigning there in heaven. So we need to understand the deity of Christ. And along with all of this, we see ourselves that the message that's being presented, and we'll know what God requires of us. And because we now have a standard, when we fall short of that standard or go beyond that standard, then we've sinned. And then we have uh, to make changes in our lives and repentance is necessary. Just even prior to uh, Christ, we mentioned this in class, John the Baptist was preaching to get ready for the kingdom. He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's near, it's coming, coming soon. And now that it's there, what's the message in Acts chapter two, what shall we do? They were told to repent and to be baptized. In Acts 17, in fact, every sermon we can find when it was necessary for people to make changes, they told them you've got to repent. And then we've got to appreciate the divine creation and understand that this didn't just happen. This is the work of God. We're living in a marvelous world, an organized world, you know, through a marvelous maker. We might not understand all of his natural laws that exist, but we understand they do exist. He put them there and he controls these. And so we need to understand that. Bible authority, you know, that we have God who tells us how to live. And he's the one with authority. And I respect that. So I can't add to or I can't take away from. And I've got to appreciate how I derive that authority for the things that we do. And there's one thing that we, we constantly will say that everything that we practice here, we believe we have authority for it. And we won't practice something that we don't believe that we have authority for. So we need authority is big and important. And just the fear of God, the supreme reverence that we have for God, but knowing that he has a promise of heaven for the faithful, and he has also the promise of hell for those that are not faithful. 
that we've got to understand and put that reverence in its right place that we, we're subject to him in all things. And then the morality, you know, and that goes to how we deal with one another. And it's not really different today than it was under the law of Moses. And it wasn't any different really than under the patriarchal law. That there's lust that we have that have to be controlled and handled properly. And so we'll just lump that together and just talk about moral things. Moral law, some people might call it. Uh, but we've got to understand that. And those are first principles. And there'll be people that do things that they don't realize God wouldn't have approved of. But when they read it, then they'll make the changes. We were talking about that in our study in the afternoon in, in 1 Corinthians, that there be those that were eating meat offered to idols. And it um, would take a while to reteach some of these people and for them to understand. But let's just put it under the category of morality. So this is just a maybe a short list of things that we would call first principles. When you've got these down, we can build upon all of this. And so the next point in building this house is we've got to have good materials. Whatever we're building, poor quality materials cause, cause problems down the road. A lot of times I'll spend more time at the hardware store or the lumber store trying to find that good lumber. You know, others will just go and grab the board and go and they wonder why the wall looks like that, you know. Well, there's a reason for that. The board you put up there looked like that, you know. And you put two boards like, oh, the other one might counteract it. I'm not a yeah, good dream. Uh, you want good materials to go into it because you want it to be something that will be reliable down the road. And there's a cheap way of doing it, inferior stuff. Uh, people will do that. They said, this is all I can afford. Well, the cheap actually becomes more expensive in a lot of cases because you keep having to replace it and keep having to fix it. If you spend 50% more to start with, you don't ever have to replace it. And so cheap is not necessarily the answer to it. It's inferior is our point. It seemed good at the time, but can you imagine building a house with crooked studs, cracked rafters, warped plywood? Well, welcome to Del Webb community. <laughs> when you tear these houses apart, you'll see that there's a lot of that, that they made correction to, to a lot of it in the building process. But that's not the norm. It's not what we really want, want to do. But some try to build spiritually with the cheap materials. They just want to get by. And just do just enough, like the illustration you used a while ago. Well, I come to worship service once a week, and that's all I do. But they consider that, that enough. But quality materials is kind of the source, really, for where you're getting your study from. Some will rely upon denominational, and we'll call that a well that we'd be drinking from. You know, that that's, that's how we consult all the time. And it's a popular book, maybe. It might be a bestseller, you know, from the bookstore perspective. And we'll go to the various web pages, and wow, this looks interesting, you know, but I'm sure Artie spends a lot of time calling through a lot of stuff for the bulletins that he puts out. And we have to appreciate him for that because not every writer tells the truth, the whole truth that's coming from God, you know, and so we need to. Where's my source of this information? Well, brother so-and-so said, I read it in a book. You know, well, uh, that could be our problem. That's not the quality. The quality book is the Bible, and we need to go there. And then some try to build upon the fluff. And there are books out there that say, here's how to build a congregation. And it's all fluff. It's no substance to it at all. It's building it with entertainment or various other things. But it's not building it because people are searching the scriptures and won't want the scriptures. And they'll call that fluff. They'll call that Bible preaching. So come and worship with us. We teach the Bible. And you're taking notes and you can't find the Bible in what you just heard. You know, it's just not there. Some try to build it on friendships or they're just the relationship that they might have. And I've known a number of people that they would be one denomination for a while and then they've got friends in another denomination and they switch to that one and the denominations don't teach the same thing but it didn't matter to them because they didn't know what it believed anyway what they believed uh, so you ask them well what does that church teach on certain things 
and I know we don't like to use that phraseology because the church don't teach it. It's the Bible does, but in those cases it does because they have their catechisms, they have their denominational doctrines that only are found in books and not found in the Bible. So in those cases, some are converted to that local group of people rather than converted uh, to Christ Jesus. And then not build with uncertain sounds. And I'm borrowing this out of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 8. And there he's talking really in the use of uh, miraculous gifts that if the trumpet, if you don't understand what the sound of it is, then how would you know what to do? That's the context of which this is used. But uncertain sounds, I'm kind of using that as a loose reference to a lot of things that we would hear. As I was changing channels last night, I was on this guy, this thing, which was one of these money uh, preachers, you know, and, and I forget how many thousands of dollars you'd have if you would do this. I didn't stay on that channel very long, but yet it sounds good to some people. Well, that's an uncertain sound. There's a lot of uncertain sounds out there. Where did it originate? Is it from God's word or is it pulled out a couple of words out of a verse and you built a doctrine? What's the context in which this is? Build with the word of God. Paul tells Timothy to study it. He tells him to rightly divide it. He tells Timothy it's the word of God. And he tells him who also had uh, spiritual gifts that he needed to study. Well, if Timothy needs study, then I need to study. We need to study God's word and the whole counsel of God's word. Not just be an expert on five chapters in the New Testament, our favorite five. What is the rest of the New Testament teaches? The whole counsel. And so there's got to be a balance of all of what God's word says. And I need to understand how it fits together. And, and then I see the bigger picture of what God's trying to tell me. But again, and I put this in several different times, we've got to build on that genuine faith. We add to that faith, but we've got to have that faith to start with before we can add to it. And then Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 9, to build without hypocrisy. You know, be genuine, genuine to the word. Try to treat the word, it's from God, and this is what God's telling me I need to do. And I'm wanting to do that because I want to be pleasing to it, and there can't be hypocrisy in there. And then another one of my favorite parts is have the right tools. Patty called me yesterday, and, you know, and I've given her some tools of her own, but she didn't have them with her yesterday, and she's calling me, I need a screwdriver. Got about 100 screwdrivers, probably. You know, we probably need three in each car or something, you know, or whatever. But we do need the right tools. Now, some of us improvise and we don't use the right tool, and uh, we pay some prices for that. Sometimes it'll work out. But drive a nail without a hammer, and I put this in there just yesterday. I was nailing a box with my big wireman pliers because I did too lazy to go get the hammer. And the wire pliers are heavy enough, they got the nail in. That's not what I would recommend. And if, if you were an apprentice, I would have to go and get the hammer and show you right. But to dig a hole, I've got to have the right kind of hole digging equipment, shovel, whatever it might be, a Maddox. Out here with the hard ground, it's probably the Maddox. Uh, might even be something pneumatic to break up the ground out here. But cutting a board without a saw, well, it's kind of hard to do without a saw but I probably should have put in here without the proper saw because I've got several different kinds of saws and I've used the wrong saw for the purpose at times and it kind of came out jagged, but it didn't matter where it's going to be. Uh, but if I want it to do right and I want everything to be pristine and I want to get the right tool and I'm going to use that, you can do anything with the right tool. And so you've got to get the right tool. You might have to go borrow it. You might have to rent it. You might not own it, but some have the right tools, but don't know how to use them. So just because somebody's got a tool, well, would you show me how to use that tool? Well, I don't know how to use it, but I got it. You know, and I've known people like that too in, in the past, but uh, there are some specialty tools that just few people have, and those we would have to kind of go out and, and borrow at times. But our building of our house, we've got the right tool. 
It's the word of God. It's right there. <clears throat> Guess what? We've got prayer that we can cast our burdens upon the Lord. We can pray. And we have a high priest that cannot be touched. Greatest high priest has ever been. The human high priest, we have problems with them. Look at Aaron, you know, from a character reference before he actually really was high priest, but still, uh, Jesus Christ is our high priest. Gargishas didn't have elders. That's a great tool. And again, that's all approved, approved by God. And then we have each other. You know, that's a that's a tool that you help me and I help you. We strengthen one another. And just because we have the tools, we want to use them properly and use them as best as we, we possibly can. And then we've got to be prepared with the right cost as well, because all of this building does cost. Generally, we need some kind of an idea, an estimate at least, before we start. And we might do one project at a time. And we will know that at the very beginning, once we get started. May most of the time, it costs you more than what you ever uh, figured. You know, some of the things that I would calculate, I'd add 10 or 15% to it because of the overruns and, and waste and so forth. And sometimes the cost really surprises you. Uh, a guy called me yesterday, wanted to borrow a drill press, and he said, he bought four blocks of wood. He said, could I guess how much they were? And they were oak. And I guessed $50. And he says, times five. What? And I couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. But he still bought them because he needed them. I couldn't believe that. But if you're going to have a house, you're going to have to pay the cost. If you're going to have carpet in the house, you've got to pay for the carpet. If you're going to have tile, you've got to pay for that. The appliances, the list goes on. You, you know you're going to have these things. Well, the spiritual house has many costs involved in it as well. We've got to learn to count the cost. Jesus, when he was talking to his disciples, he was telling them to count the cost, you know, that they were going to lose out in certain things. There's going to be relationships. There's going to be people that aren't happy with your what you're now doing. Uh, you might lose money. And uh, we have Simon uh, that because idolatry, is sinful, you know, and that was your business of making idols, then guess what? You better find another job or use that craft in a different way. Pleasure, Moses could have had the pleasures of all of the nice things that he could have had, but he'd rather serve God. And then it could even cost you your life, Revelation 2.10. And it might be some of the cost was not really counted on. And then it's going to take time. People say, well, how long will this take? Well, I now say a year and a half, <laughs> even if it's a two-day job. But we know it's going to take longer than you want it to by time. Because if you want quality and you want workmanship, that's going to take a lot more time. Quick and fast is not always good. It might work in some things. But some things just never seem to get finished. And then as we're building the spiritual, some just want to be mature overnight. I've known, I knew a guy, well, you too, Dick Radke, uh, visits here from time to time. He would, a lot of people have lived at his house, and uh, they weren't even Christians when they came in and lived there, but then it, they were converted, and immediately they wanted to start preaching. Well, they hadn't got past the babe stage yet, and they couldn't do it. It doesn't last, that quick growth. Some get discouraged that they're not what others are and they're comparing themselves uh, to other people. So it does take time to have this workable knowledge. It didn't come overnight. Uh, for spiritual maturity, as we're putting off the old man and becoming the new, it's going to take a lot of time to really become strong. And we could use the illustration of a little tree that you've just planted. You have to put the stakes and, and put the guy wire on it to hold it up. Well, at some point in time, you need to take those wires off of it because it needs to work itself against the wind so that it can get that strength on, it, on its own. It's going to take a while before you'll become that, that good teacher. It's going to take a while to build that strong marriage. Just because you said, I do, and forever, uh, when you said, said your vows to each other, you have to build upon that. And then it takes a long time to even overcome those things that are tempting to us. Bottom line is, it's never finished. 
So that's a, one difference between the other house. It's supposed to be a difference anyway. That uh, that one might, well, we'll add this, we'll add that, but we're never finished as we're growing this. So we've got to realize that all of this is how we build our spiritual house. Just the same illustration as building our others. So hopefully this was beneficial to you today and understand that this is a great relationship in Christ, but it's something we take for granted, but we've got to work on it. Every single one of us. The foundation isn't going to change. What we build on top of that foundation is what we're talking about today. And that's God's house being built with you in mind. As we're singing our song of invitation this morning, if there would be anyone here that needs to come before this group for any reason, let me know as we say. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed? Are you washed in the blood? In the blood in the soul, cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed? Are you washed in the blood? In the blood, in the soul, cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin, and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean, for be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed? Are you washed in the blood? In the blood, in the soul, cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are you garnered spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Let us pray. Our wonderful and almighty Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this hour that we've had to hear another portion of your word. And we pray that what Aaron has given to us, we study it further, deepen our faith, and learn what it takes to build your spiritual house so that we can all be contributors to your kingdom. Father, we do want to be servants and of yours and lights in the, to the community around us. And we pray that with your word and our hearts focused on you, that we can do just that. We're thankful for your son and the sacrifice he made for each and every one of us. For without that sacrifice, we're sinful and not worthy of your love. Continue to watch over each and every one of us. Continue watching over this congregation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs>